Every time a bomb like this goes off, like the one in Jakarta, the world is horrified. ISIS appears to bomb without discrimination. Muslims, non-Muslims, it doesn't seem to matter. We hear claims like they hate us, they hate our way of life. But what if the truth is more simple than that? Maybe ISIS really wants its own country to run as it sees fit. And they're using terror to force the biggest powers in the world to negotiate, to rewrite the map and install a new dictator in the Middle East. Kamran Bakari is a Middle East and South Asia specialist at the University of Ottawa. He is a fellow at the program on extremism at George Washington University. Kamran Bakari joins me live here in Toronto. Kamran, first of all, ISIS targets Muslims directly inside Syria and Iraq. We know that. But this is a very blatant example of ISIS targeting outside of the region Muslims in Istanbul and Jakarta. What do you think is going on here? Carol, I think there are a number of things that are taking place and a number of uh, goals that ISIS wants to achieve with these attacks. Uh, the first thing is uh, that it wants to shape perceptions that it is not on the defensive. It continues to be on the offensive despite the loss of territory in Iraq and less so in Syria. Uh, and it wants to shape this perception that it's everywhere. Uh, and uh, it does this by using the element of surprise. So after the Paris attacks and the attack in California, uh, the world was waiting for the next attack in the West, and they decided to hit uh, in the Far East. And so it, it, it is a sophisticated way of, of psychological operations uh, and also to, to essentially uh, say that they are a force to be reckoned with. Okay, but if they're looking to divide the world and to get more converts from the Muslim world, why would they go and strike at the heart of two Islamic countries? Because, A, their narrative is that these are not Islamic countries. Uh, these are countries in which Muslims live, uh, and but they're ruled by, quote, unquote, un-Islamic regimes that need to be toppled. Uh, and uh, they are using uh, the, uh, the disaffection within these countries uh, to their advantage. So uh, the people who committed the, the barbarous attack today uh, were not sent from Syria or Iraq. They're locals. Uh, they're locals who uh, used to be uh, in the Al-Qaeda orbit, and now they seemingly have switched sides. Note that the last time there was an attack was many years ago, uh, I believe in 2009. And uh, at the time, it was said that these are groups that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Well, today, you know, ISIS owns them. Are they, are they giving orders directly, or is this a work of inspiration? Volunteers, volunteer cells out in the world carrying out the bombing based on what they're hearing in their own, their own initiative? There is a structure. There is a process and a mechanism. Uh, it's unclear. We don't have the details yet. And it's going to be different for every place. So it's far easier. I mean, because geography at the end of the day matters. So it's far easier for them to give orders for attacks, say, in Istanbul or in, in Europe. Uh, but they're not present and they don't have the same kind of presence or footprint on the ground in all areas. So sometimes it could be people inspired, as is the case yeah. in California. Now here, we don't know just yet uh, the, the level of details that have yet to emerge, but I suspect that they're using existing networks to their advantage. Kamran, what is ISIS ultimately trying to achieve here? I mean, is this mass murder driven by hate, or is it designed to get the world to negotiate land for peace? I, I think it's the latter. Uh, it, ISIS is a very sophisticated entity, uh, and, and that's uh, something that we have yet to come to terms with. Uh, most of us uh, who are in this field trying to understand it, trying to uh, stop it, uh, are still stuck in the old uh, terrorist organization paradigm. We, mm. Though we do say that, you know, this is Al-Qaeda 4.0 or 5.0, but we're still stuck in that. ISIS uh, has established itself as uh, a kind of state, uh, and it has a, uh, a large multidivisional military force. And these attacks around the world suggest that it also has a sophisticated intelligence network uh, that is allowing it to stage such attacks. And, and through this, 
ISIS is trying to say that uh, th we are uh, not a terrorist organization or an organization. We are a, a geopolitical reality that you must come to terms with. Uh, and so that is the strategic objective. Uh, you know, there is a method to their madness. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's already... There Speaking of madness, some people thought it would be madness that the world would be negotiating with the Taliban. But here we are, China and the United States, Afghanistan and Pakistan, all trying to convince the Taliban to come to the negotiating table as we speak. But on your point, according to uh, a compilation of intelligence sources, ISIS holds a d great deal of territory. They have approximately 30,000 fighters, as you say, extensive military capabilities. And it funds itself. It's governing, in a sense. It's taxing its local businesses and whatnot. Um, the United States, Canada, all the allies, Cameron, claim that they are getting the best of ISIS with its air campaign in Syria and Iraq. A lot to work, work to do yet, they are always careful to say. Yet the foot soldiers, whoever they are, wherever they are, still managed to sow the seeds of terror. Uh, are we losing this battle? Uh, I, I, I don't think we're losing. I think that, uh, I don't think we're losing. I think that ISIS is not losing. And that's, there's a difference between the two. Uh, frankly, uh, no power, no actor, whether state or non-state, in Syria and Iraq who, ha uh, who has a stake there is really directly fighting ISIS. The geopolitics is so complicated that from the Russians to the Turks to the Americans to the Saudis to the Iranians, they all have their objectives uh, and, and therefore they're not really directly fighting against ISIS and ISIS is exploiting that. I mean, take for example the figure that you just quoted, 30,000. I mean, it's out there in the open sources. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's a reference back to a CIA estimate from uh, the year before, I think. That's in, in, right. And so, I believe it, it's, that figure is too low. We're looking at at least 200,000 people because you can't control a territory that large, stage attacks across the world, be able to govern, administer areas, have a police presence, have an intelligence network, uh, you know, and we're not even talking about their civilian uh, administrators. So this is a very sophisticated organization that we need to come to grips with if, if we're going to be able to successfully defeat it. Yeah, the, the caliphate or the so-called caliphate, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who do you think is really behind the command and control of ISIS? I think that we have to move away from personalities. I mean, one of the mistakes with ISIS that we've been uh, doing for, uh, you know, 12, 13 years, because this organization didn't come out of nowhere, it's, it's a, it has been built upon the organization that was founded by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi uh, in the early 2000s after the fall of Saddam in Iraq. We've seen their leaders come and go. We've taken out a lot of their leadership, mm. yet the organization continues to grow. It's because we are focused on personalities and we don't understand that there is a sufficient redundancy built into ISIS uh, where if one leader goes, someone else steps in. And we have to really look at it from an institutional point of view as opposed to a personality-driven analysis. Do you believe that one day we will negotiate with ISIS? Uh, I hope not, uh, I, and I don't think we will because, uh, and going back to your point about the Taliban, we're negotiating with the Taliban because the Taliban uh, repre presents itself as a nationalist force, willing to work within the framework of the Afghan national state. And so that's a different story. Uh, we're not willing to negotiate, and we shouldn't, with those who want to change the borders of the international system, uh, those who have transnational ambitions, because there's no end to it. If you negotiate, you know, with ISIS over in Iraq and Syria, uh, then where do you draw the line? I mean, t tomorrow they'll say, well, we want Saudi Arabia, North Africa. And so th uh, there is no negotiation with transnational jihadists. Cameron Bakari, a specialist in Middle East and South Asia affairs at the University of Ottawa. That was a really interesting conversation, Cameron. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. Okay.